This is episode 193 of the Mixology Talk podcast. And today we will be talking with gin and Geneva expert, Philip Duff, about similarities and differences between gins and all things Geneva. So stay tuned. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Mixology Talk podcast. Uh, so we're just now kicking off gin month um, and we're gonna do a little deep dive into gin. And I thought, who better to bring onto this podcast to educate us than the one and only, probably one of the most in, intelligent people in the world around spirits education and knowledge than the one and only Philip Duff. Philip, sorry, Philip Duff. <laughs> How you doing, man? Hey, Chris, I'm great. Thanks. It's cocktail hour here in New York. Uh, so I'm going to be even better in a few minutes than I am now. Oh, and talking about gin and Geneva, it's like, do I pay you? Like, where do I send the money? This is the best gig ever. <laughs> so uh, just so people who may not know who you are, I'm sorry, I was a little tongue tied in there. Um, but you have an extensive career in the spirits industry. Um, you started as a bartender, if I'm not mistaken. I did at the ripe old age of 15 in Ireland where I'm no from. No kidding. So what got you started in there and what kind of kept you moving forward in the career in the in the in the career that is spirits and bartending? Well, I don't know if you've ever picked potatoes, but I did, and it's one of the world's shittiest jobs, right? <laughs> like something like uh, a hundred pound bag, you got paid 25 pence, which wasn't much wow. even back then. And the other option was to bartend because I come from a very small little town, 5,000 people. Mm -hmm. And there wasn't really enough business for most of the bars to have full-time bartenders. So instead, they'd take high school kids. And if you were tall enough and didn't fuck around, you could be a bartender. So I got to be a bartender from the age of 15, and I never looked back. Oh, interesting. Excellent. And I was looking over your bio, and it's kind of a, like... I, I hate to even like try to encapsulate it, but you've won kind of all the awards there are to win, and you've you've had a presence in the spirits industry for a very long time. Um, so, can you kind of talk a little bit about your journey uh, as a bartender to where you are now, briefly? Yeah. So essentially, my career path was the movie Cocktail, which was about as good as co career advice as you would get in <laughs> Ireland back then. So I went from bartending in my native. Dublin to London, then mm -hmm. to the Cayman Islands, where I ran a bar on the beach. Stop me if any of this sounds familiar. I bartended illegally in New York, and I actually left because I really enjoyed New York, and I thought, I don't want to get deported, which turned out okay 20 years down the line, because now I live here, American wife and all that sort of thing. Um, before I left Ireland, I picked up a degree in marketing, because I thought I might want to do something useful. And some people would say, oh, I've never used it. I've used it every single day because when I wound up living in Holland, I began to be hired by all these drinks companies. Now, this is going to blow everyone's mind, so make sure you're sitting down. This was before the internet. <gasps> so, <laughs> so all this new knowledge coming out because of people like Dale DeGroff and Dick Bradsell, you had to know Dale or Dick or go to their bars. There weren't even any good books. There was no blogs. So if you had this mythical knowledge, you were a golden god. And people just like drove semi-trucks to your house full of cash asking you to help their liquor brand. So when that started happening, I'm like, okay, I get this because I can speak to marketing people. I understand where they're coming from and what they're looking for. Mm -hmm. And then I can translate that into what's wor what works and what's useful. So most of my gig is what I call on-trade engagements, either education programs, uh, competitions, the Beluga Vodka Signature Program. I created the G-Vine uh, Gin Connoisseur Program. I've been a consultant for Diageo World Class, uh, Pernod Rico Bar Smarts, all that sort of thing. And I also do product development. So we create them from scratch. We reposition them. Sometimes I'm hard to do research on brands that a company owns because they don't know that much about it themselves, right down to copywriting and to prove that, I put my money where my mouth is. I have my own brand, Old Duff Geneva. Uh, there it is. Uh, which is kind of a great shop window. And it makes me feel like the 17 years I spent living in Holland weren't a total waste. <laughs> Excellent. So the, the category of gin is very diverse. Um, and I think that when most people say the word gin and start to think about gin, they think of these 
uh, more classic London dry style gins because they're probably the most prevalent in the market. Um, but there are, from my understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, but there are five major categories of gin. Um, but that was a, a couple of years ago that I did that research. Does that sound about right? It's how many ways to skin a cat, mm -hmm. honestly, but the five that you're referring to are as good five delineations as any, you know? Sure. Mm -hmm. And so those five would be, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, London Dry, uh, we have Geneva, uh, we have um, kind of the new style, the new Western Dry, I think is what they call it, Plymouth and Old Tom. Is that kind of the big ones out there? Yeah, so let's just say right or wrong, uh, that's what a lot of people would think. And sure. what I would do is I would go ahead and I would take Plymouth out of there. Mm -hmm. oh, and I take Geneva out of there as well. So we can get into this later on. But the sort of TLDR right now is Geneva is the grandparents of gin. It is. But it is the parent of whiskey. And I say that as an Irishman. We invented that shit. And... Because back in the day, the first ever recipe or one of the first recipes ever committed to paper for whiskey was for Irish whiskey, obviously. It was in a book called Platt's Delights for Ladies. And it was sort of a guide for gentle ladies how to run a household, which then included brewing and distilling. And it said that you took a gallon of aqua composita, meaning a grain distillate, and you added two pounds of fennel, licorice, juniper. That sounds like Geneva to me because whiskey wasn't routinely aged until the 1800s. So whiskey is, sorry, Geneva is what whiskey was. Geneva is like going to the zoo and they don't have a picture of a T-Rex. They've got a live one, you know? <laughs> so I just for that reason, and we'll get into it a bit later, I'll take Geneva out of that, but I'm going to, you know, have everybody lying on the fainting couch when I say this. Plymouth as well. Plymouth was a geographical indication. So if you made it in the city in this way, blah, blah, you got the geographical indication. It wasn't a style indication and it sure. isn't now. And the owner of Plymouth Gin, Perna Ricard, have actually let the GI lapse. What they have done is uh, they could have renewed it and they didn't. Interesting. And what may be more interesting is that Plymouth has been a lot of different things. In the 1920s, uh, it's pretty incontrovertible that Plymouth, it was called gin, but it was Geneva. It tasted like Geneva. It was made like Geneva. And what we know now, what you know as Plymouth Gin that was relaunched in the USA about 20 years ago is a totally different animal. The distillery had been closed for ages. Three entrepreneurs bought it. They had no idea what to do with it. Mm -hmm. And they made the strength of it a little bit above the standard. Then the standard was 40% uh, ABV. Now it's three, seven and a half. And they got a lucky break because the TV chef, Delia Smith, said that she used it for gin and tonics and she liked it because it was whatever it is, 43 point da -da -da thing. And that was their thing. Mm -hmm. Like Ply So Plymouth gin is a very delicious gin. It's a very, very nice gin, but it isn't a style. So then we're left with uh, London gin, uh, New Western gin. And what was the other one you put in? Old Tom gin. Perfect. Okay. So, and then uh, that would make a lot of sense because I, re I remember reading somewhere that Plymouth, unless it was distilled in Plymouth, it could not be gin, uh, Plymouth gin. So that would definitely make sense from a geography uh, standpoint. Um, so can you talk a little bit about what each style kind of tastes like for a lot, lack of a better uh, word? All right. Well, I'm going to throw another spanner in the works and say okay. that the um, European Union and its regulations guide everything that's made in Europe. And as it stands so far, even though the UK has formally left the European Union, um, they haven't made any changes to their spirits yet, sure. right? And uh, last year, they updated the regulations for the EU. So if you Google EU, I think it's EU 787, um, you can see the updated requirements. And what's important is you have a uh, gin. If you make gin in the European Union, mm -hmm. and let's include England in that, it has to be at least 37.5% alcohol. It has to have a, a predominant juniper smell and taste. Never been tested in court, so whatever. And it has to use uh, 
spirits of agricultural origin. So it could be grain, it could be sugar beet, whatever. That's fine. So what you can do is you can get a bucket of alcohol, mm -hmm. right? And get some juniper flavoring and stick it in there. Bob's your uncle. That's it. If you want to call this distilled gin, mm -hmm. perhaps unsurprisingly, you got to do some distilling. You can either distill the base spirit with juniper or you can distill juniper with the other botanicals, but there's got to be some distilling somewhere. And that's also got to be at least 37.5%. And then the third one is London gin, not London dry, London gin, which does not have to be made in London or even England. It just means that all the botanicals have to go into the still. Oh, I see. Now, okay. I don't know if you've ever been present at uh, distilling, but I'm going to tell a little story about some friends of mine that were in Mexico. They were in Mexico and visiting a mezcal distillery, and the mezcal distillery was making pechuga. You know what pechuga is? I, it's been a while since I've heard of it, but please refresh us. It's well, essentially, you're sticking anything you like in there, but a lot of the time it's meat. It's like oh, you put right. a chicken in the still or some venison. Yeah. You can also put in fruits, right? And they had never been to a mezcal distillery before. So they were distilling at that distillery with chicken. So they're going to hang a whole chicken in the still. And they asked, hey, guys, after you're done, can we have the chicken? They're like, it's going to be the best barbecue chicken ever. And of course, when they open the still, it's like this blackened skeleton. <laughs> Because distilling is extremely destructive. And I guess that's what I want to get across, Chris. London gin, you can only really use botanicals that survive distillation. Sure. So you need extremely tough, robust ones, like seeds and roots and shit. I'll give you an example. A very famous gin, Hendrix, is distilled gin, but it's not London gin. Mm -hmm. Because they use distillates of stuff like cucumber and rose that would never survive having to be in the same distillation thing. So now, you, so you've got uh, gin, distilled gin, and London gin. Okay. Now, your old Tom is a, a throwback. It actually refers to a distiller who would sell an unadulterated, high strength, somewhere between forty-seven and fifty-five percent ABV gin to his favorite clients, and they would typically sweeten it and water it down a bit. Okay. And what most people understand as old Tom is what gin was until the very end of the 1800s. And that was to say relatively strong, rectified grain spirit with a lot of juniper in it and quite a bit of sugar because until about 1751, distilling wasn't very good. It was a lot of people distilling in their backyard, in their bathtub, in their living room. They were as shitty at distilling as people like me are at podcasting from my hallway. This is like the hallway of my apartment, <laughs> right? This is not exactly the Joe Rogan show here, right? On, on my end, your end looks amazing. <laughs> so... By the end of the 1800s, crossing into the 1900s, sugar began to be reduced, reduced, reduced. By about 1900, you had what was called the London dry style, which is to say with no sugar. And that was a huge hit abroad, especially in America. And London dry became the dominant style of gin. And then about 10 or 15 years ago, a friend of mine, Ryan McGarian, who the founder or co-founder of Aviation Gin, another Ryan owns Aviation now. This is like the original Ryan. Ryan McGarian came up with the term New Western Gin. Mm -hmm. I first heard it at a seminar at Tales of the Cocktail, although I think he might have posted it online before then. And his justification is like, well, you know, there's so many distilleries. Craft distilling really got going in the US first on the West Coast, especially the Pacific uh, Northwest. And he saw so many people doing interesting things with gin and they were not having juniper dominant gin. Like Tanqueray, 47%, boom. It's like, you like juniper? Here's some more juniper. You want some more? You want some more juniper? We've got juniper. We've got juniper here everywhere. And they were making different gin where juniper was just one more note in the symphony. So he coined the term new Western gin, which I think is a valid thing. And it's, it's kind of become a real thing. And now it's 2021. Sure. And it, from my understanding, uh, it sounds like gin was still a present uh, botanical in, in the distillation. It just wasn't the dominant uh, focus of that particular style of, of gin. Um, so, and that's where you get a lot more of that citrus driven, a uh, little bit more subdued juniper in that particular style, correct? 
Yeah, exactly. And it always existed. It mm. really did. But gin dominated until the 1960s, globally, everywhere. And it's really gin was really simple. It was very strong, mm -hmm. 94 proof, 47%. It was English, or at least it had a picture of some white guy with a bowler hat and an umbrella and shit. And it was packed to the gills with juniper. That's what gin was. That was it. That was gin. Yeah. And starting really in, I think it was 1985, if I'm not mistaken, with Bombay Sapphire, people began to subvert that paradigm, if you'll pardon the uh, $10 words. They began to say, okay, we like gin, you know, but does it have to be like that? In the same way, you've now got new entrants to the market, redefining what Tennessee whiskey is. Mm -hmm. um, that's what happened. And Bombay Sapphire was the first one. And I actually have a nice story about that. Before he died, because it would have been awkward to uh, interview him afterwards, I actually interviewed the guy, Michel Roux, who created everything you know about Absolute Vodka. And then when his company had Absolute taken away from them, he immediately took over uh, Bombay and he created Bombay Sapphire. And I had an extremely boozy lunch with him in St. Augustine, where he lived. And after, I think, the second bottle of wine, it was lunch, he was French, uh, I said, so Michel, you know what a lot of people say about Bombay Sapphire? What I was trying to say to him was like, it doesn't taste like fucking gin, it's not juniper. And he said, Phil, I honestly didn't care. I told the distillery, uh, which was Green Alls in England, in the north of England, the Warrington uh, distillery. He said, I need something to taste different from everything out there. I don't care what it is. And that's, you know, what brought, that was kind of the birth, really, of the new Western gin category, because Bombay is a huge success. Uh, without Bombay, we would not have 90% of all the modern gins. It, it, it did for gin what Absolute did for vodka. Sure, absolutely. And I think... Um... Absolutely no pun there or wordplay, um, but uh, <laughs> I, I I do agree with you. Like it just it's a different style, and I think it's a level more approachable, especially if you're not used to that big heavy hand of of juniper um, kind of in your face like Tangray, which I am going to go ahead and admit I do love that. Um, but I, I'll I'll also admit something else. I when I first had Gen uh, Geneva, it was probably about ten years ago um, when. I think Bowles uh, really serves. Um, I didn't know what it was. I couldn't wrap my head around it. And I knew it wasn't gin. I was expecting it to be gin because that's where my head was at at the moment. Um, but it wasn't. And it was so different. And I couldn't quite pin down the flavors of it. So can you kind of talk about Geneva and kind of what that is and what, how that is so much different from modern gin? Absolutely. So... I mean, this is like a 10 hour seminar, but I'm going to. I know. <laughs> what it is. One thing that's really important for us all to know is that things were not routinely aged in barrels for flavor until the mid to late 1800s. They were transported in barrels, but you actually then picked the most neutral barrels that you could find. So barrel aging was not a thing. However, distillers have always been the same. They want consistency. They want tasty stuff. And, of course, recreational alcohol drinking grew out of using alcohol to preserve herbs and spices that were medicinal. And juniper, by the way, is a miracle drug because the most complicated thing in the world to operate on is your belly. There is evidence of Aztecs in South America who had brain surgery, like chunks of their brain opened and things fixed and their brain and head healed up and they lived for 20 years further. But there is no evidence of people surviving intestinal surgery, right, before the 1800s. So Juniper fixes all that shit. Everything south of your belly button, it's good for. Everything from causing an abortion to aiding your digestion, uh, all that kind of thing. It's a magical, magical drug. So... People would stick in juniper. And juniper, by the way, is also cheap. It's mm -hmm. endemic, or it was, across all of Europe. It grew in Scotland, Ireland, England, Holland, Germany, France, the whole thing. Right? It's a little spiky little, little bush. Um, so what distillers would do would be that they would add 
certain redistillations or macerations or whatnot of herbs and spices, including juniper, to their distillates so that it would be consistent from batch to batch, so that it would be tasty. Mm-hmm. You got to bear in mind, we're, we're, we're going back to the 1300s. We're going back to a time when there was no sugar in Europe. Can you imagine that? There was no sugar. So the only sweet things might be some herbs and roots you had. You might be able to get licorice root because licorice root is actually quite sweet. Mm-hmm. And you can put that in there. So all they were doing was trying to create consistency from batch to batch. Geneva is the original whiskey. It's whiskey. It is unaged whiskey. That's really what it is. It's unaged whiskey with a tiny amount of juniper and maybe some other things. That's all it is. And when I say a tiny amount, uh, my brand, Old Duff Geneva. Oh, look at that. Beautiful bottle, by the way. Ah, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, It's a mega legit old school Geneva. I call it the Del Maguey Mezcal of Geneva's. And it's like as if you were drinking Geneva in the 1700s. It is a minuscule amount of juniper distillate. Like we redistill juniper in the Geneva itself in a 50 liter still. And that gives us enough for like a 10,000 bottle run. Wow. It's a really tiny amount, but it's very important. The fact that it's minuscule does not mean it's not important at all. What happened was when uh, England got a Dutch king, long story, original reality show, you know, England's next top monarch. Uh, Everybody started to make Geneva. Also because at the time, London, we're talking 1689, by the way, London had a lot of refugees from political persecution in uh, Belgium and Holland. They fled to London and they were used to making Geneva. And this new Dutch king, he lowered the taxes on the ceiling. So everyone tries to make Geneva. However, Geneva is difficult because you need whiskey skills. And nobody had them. So what do you do if you fuck up as a bartender? Well, it's the same if you're a distiller. You just add lots of sugar, right? (laughs) And they also, they began to put in 20 times the amount of botanicals. And then in 1830, when uh, column distillation became a thing, they switched from using essentially a whiskey base Mm-hmm. to a neutral spirits base. And that was the birth of gin. And thank God, because gin is delicious and gin is fantastic, but it's so completely different. I like to say that gin is Paris Hilton and Geneva is Conrad Hilton, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and when I when I first tried it, uh, the thing that really struck me, um, your analogy to whiskey was 100%, like it tastes malty, it tastes kind of sweet. And my brain couldn't wrap my head around that as kind of, you know, I'm anchored in gin, but I'm tasting whiskey notes here. And I just couldn't translate it well uh, as kind of an um, anchor point for, for tasting. Like, where do I go from here? So the minute I, f- I discovered that the base spirit was from malted wheats and, you know, um, that kind of stuff, then it made sense to me. I'm like, oh, okay. Now I can start pick apart this, the flavor, the taste. And now I know how to use it in cocktails once I got that point. But I think until you wrap your head around, like, what does it come from and what's the production process? I, I think it's hard to kind of just grab it just by the taste, for me anyways. I mean, the industry doesn't help. Uh, mm-hmm. Starting 200 years ago, 300 years ago, colonialism was happening. Holland ruled half the world. England ruled the other half. Even, you know, Portugal was grabbing colonies. And They were literally at war with one another, but they also wanted to trade with one another. They kind of had to very often. Mm -hmm. And Geneva was Geneva. There was no gin back then. It was just Geneva. But then gin became popular. So the Dutch distillers started labeling it Geneva gin. Mm -hmm. Right. And English people would bugger it up and they call it Geneva, like the Swiss city. So the Dutch distillers would be like, we don't care. Call it Geneva if you want to. Call it gin if you want to, which was really stupid. Like the French would never do that with cognac. They wouldn't call cognac, you know, age grape vodka or something. But the Dutch are, the mentality is generally short-term trading. It's like, give me the money now. Let's see the money now. And that leads to the confusion. But even to this day, that Balls Geneva that you tasted, I helped to create that. I was on the whole team. 
I was on the uh, tasting panel, the marketing team. I wrote the text for the back label, everything. And unfortunately, a few years after it launched, because everybody in the marketing team has an MBA, they see, oh my God, gin's selling really well. We should tell people, you know, if you like gin, you should try Geneva. Geneva is the grandfather of gin. Geneva. If you like gin, you should try Geneva, which is like saying, if you like hugs, you should try a punch in the throat, <laughs> right? It's like selling Rittenhouse rye to somebody who enjoys drinking Cointreau, <laughs> right? <laughs> and they just can't help themselves from doing it. They're sure. just drooling, looking at those gin sales. Right. They're like, oh, if we can get like 0.1% of that, we'll be exactly. great. Yeah, exactly. And it, it, it's just madness. Like I, I feel like I'm pushing the boulder up the mountain every day. I, I, I want to get a t-shirt that says, it's not gin, man. You know? <laughs> well, and this kind of brings me to my next question is um, what made you really want to create Old Dufsen? Like, it sounds like it, it was a lot of education like that had to happen in order to really be successful in that space. So what made you kind of decide, I'm in, let, let's do this? Uh, so I was in Holland and I had learned Dutch and I was going to the Geneva Museum all the time in the town of Schiedam. So Schiedam is this little town right next to Rotterdam in Holland, where I lived. And the current population is 14,000. It was once as high as 24,000, but it housed 392 distilleries. Wow. It supplied the whole freaking world. It was the predominant distilling city of the world. Sure. Like in the same period, Around the 1850s, when Jerry Thomas was opening all those bars and stuff, just the harbor of New York, just New York, imported 450 bottles of Geneva for every one bottle of English gin. Wow. So it was a really big deal. Sure. And uh, one of my clients, Balls, they were hiring me. I was going around the world, you know, Australia, China, Japan, teaching about cocktails because that's the main thing for their liqueurs. And they decided they wanted to create uh, Geneva. And I was on that team from the get-go. As I say, I wound up being on the tasting panel. I wrote the label. I pushed them to make it high malt, high strength, cocktails only, historical thing. And they did everything right. I'm very proud of that product. And I, if I was stuck on a desert island, only balls Geneva, I'd be a very happy man. But just as we were about to launch, I was in a meeting with the CEO. I said, Philip, how much do you think it should cost? It was going to launch in America. I was like, oh, I don't know. How much should it cost? And he looked me in the eye and he goes, $40 trade price for a bar, like $40 for a bar to buy it in. I said, that seems like a lot. Where did you get $40 from? And he looked me in the eye and he said, that's what Grey Goose cost. So they launched at $40. Everyone loved it. Nobody could afford it. And the product, it pains me to say it, hasn't done as well as it should. So I was like, okay, I could do this and not fuck up. Mm -hmm. And I had learned uh, that Balls and most of the competitors to Kuiper Russia, they don't actually distill. Whenever you see made in Holland on a bottle, it's a lie because they're buying in the, the malt wine, the mm -hmm. Myrna, from a distillery in Belgium, a delicious, great distillery. And they're just adding neutral alcohol and saying made in Holland on the bottom. I thought, okay. I could not do that, mm -hmm. and I could uh, create something that would go into a bar for the magic price of $25 for a trade price, dollar an ounce. So that gave me the idea to develop this bad boy, uh, double gold in San Francisco. Thank you very much. Available <laughs> at all good liquor stores. And in order to do that, we had to develop our own base, our own malt wine. Mm -hmm. And then I thought, I learned there's only three, three, 100% malt wine Genevers with the seal of Schiedam, this paper label that means it's made like it was 100 years ago in the world. Actually, there was only two. I thought I could be the third one. You know, I'm like, how often do you get this chance right. to resurrect a dead category? So I thought I'll create this as well. And then if I go into a bar and I'm begging them to buy it, then I have two bottles instead of one. And if they feel sorry for me, they might buy one, right? And in actual fact, it's it's been fantastic. In fact, this is now the best-selling 100% malt wine Geneva in the world. 
which is like being taller than Tom Cruise. It's not <laughs> that much of an achievement. However, I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Well, and that, that was actually a question I was going to ask you, what, why you decided to go with um, the two different styles. And it just makes a ton of sense. I mean, at, at 25 bucks all day long, right? But I agree with you. When I, I bought a bottle of um, the Bulls when it was released, and I, I couldn't put it on my cocktail menu. It was just it was too expensive. I was like, I'd really want to, but nobody's gonna yeah. buy a twenty dollar cocktail. So no, I think I think the problem was that the Balls Company had been taken private in a venture capital deal. Mm -hmm. um, a member of the board of Remy had quit, and they offered to sell it to him. So he took on all this venture capital money, and I think he I, I'm completely guessing here. I think he literally wanted to say to the investors, "We've got the next Grey Goose." Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. So um, when you drink Geneva, what is your favorite way to enjoy it? Uh, I am enjoying it the way that I like to enjoy it right now, which is straight. But uh, no, I love, love, love cocktails. Mm -hmm. But before I get to cocktails, I'm going to tell you, like, this is my path to glory. And I advise to everybody, gourmet beer pairings. I first saw this almost 20 years ago in Australia, a bar open called Shady Pines. And it was opened by all these guys who'd worked at Milk and Honey in London and PDT and shit like that. But all they really had was amazing gourmet beers and incredible spirits. And the bartenders looked like homeless people, but they were refugees from Milk and Honey and whatnot. And they would advise you on the perfect spirit to have with the perfect beer. And people got into it. It's the perfect mix of highbrow and lowbrow. Mm -hmm. So I really believe, I love drinking 100% malt wine Geneva with either chocolate nitro stout or uh, a Kolsch or a lager. Nice. And I, okay. and I love drinking this one, which is 53% malt wine. It's a bit more approachable. I love drinking this with either an IPA or a Saison, like a okay. farmhouse ale. These are big. So obviously, everyone wants to make cocktails. I said this for bowls, and I'm not going to contradict myself now. The best uh, Geneva cocktail in the world, for a beginner anyway, is a Collins. The Collins was invented in New York. It was named in London. It is, you can make a Collins with vodka. You can make a Collins with gin. A Collins with Geneva is so fucking good. It's ridiculous. I'm working on a canned one right now. And remember, if you make your Collins with Philip Duff's Geneva, it is, of course, a Phil Collins. <laughs> and I'm just going to say, if you say that to a guest and they don't laugh, you need to ask for their ID because they're too young. <laughs> yeah, it's a good litmus test. That's not bad. <laughs> um, what, what's really interesting is I remember when I went to uh, Mexico for tequila tasting uh, or a tour, I remember they made a beer um, that was an agave-based beer. Um, and the pairing between tequila and that agave base beer was one of the best experiences I've ever had from like a drinks perspective. Um, you know, they just, since they had similar base spirits or manufacturing, yeah. um, ingredients, it, they just really played really well together. And imagine that Geneva is very similar in its, you know, production method as a source material as beer. So you have a lot of wheat, you have a lot of grains. So I can see the, the harmony between these two ingredients. Um, and now I know what I'm going to be doing over the weekend. So thank you. By the way, yeah. we, couldn't get you a, we couldn't get you a sample in time. I'll get you some. No it's worries. just very <laughs> modestly. You, you can drink Old Duff Geneva in China, Macau, Australia, New Zealand. But in the US, it's only New York State and brilliantly North Carolina because some bartenders there really wanted it and they hassled the state liquor board. No kidding. I know it's brilliant, isn't it? Oh my gosh! So uh, that, and I have to make a Phil Collins now because that's, you must make a Phil Collins. That's hilarious! That's too funny. <laughs> um, so you mentioned some of the other things you were working on: the bottle cocktail. Anything else uh, that you got coming out in the near future? Yeah, so we're keeping the Beluga Vodka Education Program going, mm -hmm. which is, you know, uh, obviously vodka, really, but. 
the beluga one from Siberia is extremely legit, it's extremely well made, and their their major thing is luxury. And over the past few years, we've been able to get in friends of mine, legends in the industry, people like Nico De Soto and Marion Becke, to talk about what luxury is and where it's going. And it's more important now than ever. So we're definitely doing lots of stuff. We're doing the new education program all around rum for Angostura, which mm-hmm. is a very deep dive, like into psychology, modernist techniques, into health and self-care, everything. That's wow. really, really cool. Uh, I think canned cocktails are not going to go away. So we're developing a canned Phil Collins. Let's hope that Mr. Collins himself does not sue me. Uh, <laughs> Free publicity if you do. <laughs> I'm such a huge fan of Phil Collins. I really was even before. You know, I didn't even think of it. We were at the launch of Old Duff in New York in 2017. Uh-huh. And I'd been like going crazy. It's, it's it, the best practice for launching a spirits brand is opening bars because it's always last minute. You're always painting the toilets an hour before people arrive. So I wasn't stressing out too much, but I had just like briefed the person who created these posters, Ms. Natalie Check. Excellent uh, artist, if you need one. And I had like Collins, and we called it like the old Duff Collins. And at the launch party, Don Lee from PDT turned to me and said, why didn't you call it the Phil Collins? And I was like, oh, like I was so busy. I just failed to see that golden opportunity. <laughs> but now it's a thing. You can get a Phil Collins. <laughs> now, it, now it is a thing. There's actually a Phil Collins on the menu at the celebrity chef Tom Colicchio's brilliant bar, the Beekman down in the financial district. So uh, as soon as I feel brave enough to get on the subway, I'm going to go down there and have one. Nice. Excellent. Um, so you mentioned that it's only available in the United States in two states. That's right. Uh, New York and North Carolina. Um, so is there any other way for people in the United States to get it? Or is it only in that market? Yeah, no. You know what's happened? And I'm sure you've seen it too, Chris, is that uh, direct-to-consumer and e-commerce has exploded. Mm-hmm. And we're available on liquor stores like astorwines.com, who ship to 30 states. And I actually started doing some advertisements only a week ago. And I'm starting to get reorders from Astor Wines, from the Liquor Board of North Carolina. Like, it's crazy because you're kind of, we're all stuck at home. Right. People want to do stuff. Like, there's an online community around a cocktail box delivery service called Shaker and Spoon, mm-hmm. right? And their Facebook group ballooned last March from 7,000 to 20,000. And a lot of them are just making all the drinks. So we even had a cocktail competition. Uh, this is I'm Just Here for the Drinks by Souther Teague. You can actually order signed personalized copies of this from Souther if you look them up. Uh, he's at Creative Drunk on uh, Instagram. And he's got a brilliant old Duff cocktail. I showed you in all its glory here. Oh, that is stunning. Right? Uh, so it's, it's, it's sort of, it's like old Duff, brandy, uh, strega, and you paint it with Peychaud's bitters. And we did a little contest. We mailed out some goodies to people who posted the next photo but people have been ordering online from astorwines.com which is also a tremendous uh great high quality place that has the best prices on liquor and ships all around the usa so perfect excellent and then um last last question for you favorite social media platform and handle for old buffs i i think my favorite probably still is instagram okay Instagram, you know, at Old Duff Geneva, as 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 it should say there behind me, right on my uh, my high tech uh, poster board there. But I I'm looking into getting on Clubhouse. I mean, I'm on Clubhouse, uh-huh. and I've been invited onto some talks already on Clubhouse, and I think I've just got to dip my toe in the water. Probably the talk would be like me and one other person. You know, like one of my relatives, maybe out of pity, but it does sound really cool. And Clubhouse is the iPhone social media platform. Is that it's correct? only on the iPhone at the moment. Yeah. So. God, I keep hearing a lot about it. I'm I'm an Android guy, so I probably won't be allowed in. <laughs> it's like it's like you know the you can get those uh, federal emergency warnings, 
and it seems you only get them on iPhones. It's like they they want to kill off the Android people. It's like, you know, there's an avalanche coming, but not if you have Android. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's too funny. <laughs> cool. We'll definitely have to go uh, and put those links in the show notes. So uh, head on over to mixologytalk.com and we'll have links to all the places you can find Old Duff Geneva, the social media handles, the website, all the good stuff we talked about here. Um, but Philip, I can't thank you enough, man, for your time. Um, I'm excited to try your Geneva in the future. Make a Phil Collins and do a, uh, a beer and um, a Geneva tasting. I'm excited. That'd be my pleasure. We can talk about that Japanese gin as well. Oh, yeah, that's right. You mentioned earlier off, offline that um, my family's from Okinawa, uh, my heritage, and you just released or you helped release a Okinawan gin, correct? That's right. And do you want to, uh, what's the name of it? Just uh, for everyone's curiosity. It's called Origin, O-R-I hyphen Jin. And I think it's available outside Japan as well. I know it's available in Taiwan. But I was asked to come up with a name for this shochu-based gin by the lady who owns a shochu distillery that I had visited in Okinawa at about one in the morning in a speakeasy called Barke in Okinawa, where, by the way, she was drinking all of us under the table despite being 86 years old. And... I thought of my friend's bar and I got a napkin and I just scribbled down origin like that. A year later, I was on a family vacation back in Okinawa and she picked us up from the airport, took us to lunch and unveiled a range of gins. And they had replicated my bar scribble literally from a coaster. Oh my goodness. It's it's so perfect. It's freaky. <laughs> And uh, now they've got like a regular, a strong one, a tropical one, a strawberry one. They've got a range of bitters, all origin bitters. That's incredible. On a little tiny island of Okinawa, man, you're just killing it. <laughs> That's it. I'm very big in Okinawa. <laughs> all right, Phil. Well, thank you again so much. And uh, yeah, we'll talk to you again, hopefully in the future. I'd really like that, Chris. Thank you. So once again, thanks to Philip Duff for joining us. Um, he truly is a gin and Geneva expert, and we cannot thank him enough for his time. So if you want to learn more about his products, definitely go check him out over at oldduffgeneva.com. But we'll also have some links in the show notes too, uh, for you as well over at mixologytalk.com slash 193. So uh, yeah, if you're just getting into craft cocktails, or if you want to grab some bar tools, definitely go check out our shop over at shop.abarabub.com. I'm a little bit biased, but I think we got some pretty amazing tools, uh, and hopefully that'll help you in your adventures in cocktails. Um, so we'll have some more podcasts for everybody in the future, but until then, have a great drink, and stay safe. Cheers. <laughs>